94 new cases, bringing the total number of active cases to 15,750. 67 people are in hospital with COVID, no one is in ICU. Of the, of the new cases, 1,758 were confirmed via PCR test and 1,836 were self-reported rat tests. Yesterday, more than 17,000 PCR tests were carried out and I'd like to thank everyone who got tested and for all of those people who continue to get vaccinated, particularly your third dose. As expected, cases of COVID continue to steadily increase and we can expect this to continue now that we have Omicron in our community. Thankfully, we are still seeing smaller numbers of people in hospital, which is a credit to our very high vaccination rates. However, as we anticipated, isolation requirements are starting to become a burden for some critical industries, and this is likely to increase as caseloads grow. That's why we are announcing today that as of 12.01 a.m. on a Thursday, our very high caseload settings will take effect. This means businesses can register critical workers in specified industries deemed critical. Businesses that have registered their critical workforce will have the option to implement these strict protocols for asymptomatic critical workers, identified as close contacts, to allow them to work if mutually agreed between the employer and the employee. As announced in January, these workers will be required to, ad to adhere to the following testing and isolation protocols. They must return a negative rat test daily prior to or on arrival at work. Wear a surgical mask while at work and when traveling outside to outside the home. Self-isolate when not at work. And if symptoms develop, follow the symptomatic close contact rules. A critical worker is someone whose role cannot be undertaken at home and who performs a role that is essential to maintaining critical services and avoiding catastrophic losses. Or, as was announced in January, has specialist skills in one of the following industries. Transport, freight and logistics, including public transport. Food, beverage and pharmaceutical manufacturing, supply and retail. Petrol stations and truck stops. Agriculture, for the purpose of food supply and biosecurity. Critical resources including mining, power, utilities and waste management services, building and construction, corrective and judicial services, police and emergency services, schools and childcare, healthcare services, social assistance and residential care, veterinary services, defence and funeral, crematorium and cemetery services. Not all of these industries will need to employ the very high caseload setting now, and some may never have to trigger the use of the critical worker setting. But the change we are announcing today means that from tomorrow, they will have the option of using them when they really need to. Importantly, there is no change to the isolation period for confirmed COVID cases. Cases will still need to isolate for seven days. This applies not only to critical workers, but to all West Australians. Under current rules, if you are living in a home with a case, you must isolate for seven days from the time you last had contact with that case. This may mean that currently, a close contact needs to remain in isolation longer than the confirmed case. With the new, very high caseload settings taking effect tomorrow, there will be some adjustments to the isolation period for household close contacts. In line with nationally agreed standards, a household close contact will only be required to complete a static seven days isolation from the time of the case's positive test, provided the close contact has a negative uh, six day PCR test or day seven rat. This recognises that a case will be most infectious prior to, symptoms on, prior to symptom onsets or at the time of testing and that a household contact is most likely to develop the disease in the first three to six days after exposure. I can also announce the Chief Health Officer has also determined that after you have recovered from COVID, you are exempt from being identified as a close contact and the required isolation for a period of eight weeks since you have recovered from COVID symptoms. This is consistent with the national approach and is important for the continuity of business operation while minimising the distribution, uh, while minimising the dis disturbance to people's lives. We are confident these sensible measures will strike the right balance 
between public safety and the need for critical services to carry on. Thank you all for your continued understanding and cooperation at this difficult time. And I'll hand over to the Education Minister before taking questions. Thanks, Amber, and good morning, everybody. We have seen the number of schools impacted by cases of COVID-19 steadily rise over the last month. As at 5 o'clock, 5 p.m. yesterday, 587 schools across WA were dealing with active cases. So far this year, 1,400 school staff and more than 17,000 students have isolated due to either being positive or in isolation as a close contact. The number of cases is going to increase over coming weeks. And today you've just heard the Minister for Health announce we're moving to very high caseload settings. This includes in schools and childcare settings. This means two areas of change which have already been flagged and are in place in other jurisdictions. It's about revising the isolation rules for school staff and students who are close contacts and implementing the critical worker protocols. Back at the end of January, I outlined a series of close contact definitions that school and childcare settings would adopt once WA entered a very high caseload environment. Those definitions were based on the South Australian model. South Australia implemented those measures and because of the delayed reopening of the WA border, we've had the luxury of being able to watch and learn from their experience. I've been advised that the South Australian experience was that the change in those settings were difficult for people to understand. The Chief Health Officer in his advice has also rightly pointed out that the WA community is now familiar with the close contact definitions in place now and can effectively apply those definitions in their own situations. So the definitions of close contacts will remain. Every jurisdiction in Australia has put in place a system to ensure asymptomatic students can continue with their schooling. We've adjusted our approach that will be implemented when the schools uh, enter very high case settings tomorrow. The goal of these changes is to minimise disruption to face-to-face -face learning, particularly for students who are not showing any signs of being unwell, that is they're asymptomatic in that very high caseload environment. From tomorrow, all school staff will be classified as critical workers. This is necessary because of the critical role that teachers and education staff play in our society. To assist school staff with meeting the critical worker requirements, schools have already received more than 230,000 rats for use by staff who've been identified as close contacts because they cannot be replaced with relief staff and who consent to return to work while they are asymptomatic. The Department of Education has distributed these rats to public and non-government schools across the state. A school staff member who is a close contact but is not showing any symptoms is identified by their school as a critical worker when there is no other staff member or relief worker to perform their duties. They can be asked by the principal if they consent to return to work and if they consent, they will be provided with seven rapid antigen tests. That critical worker will then be required to confirm with the school each day the result of the RAT, which the school will record. The critical worker will be asked by their principal to ring, email or otherwise communicate their RAT result to the school's designated contact. Principals will be provided today with the template that they can use to record that result. From tomorrow, revised school-based close contact protocols will be in place for school students to minimise the disruption to their learning. The Chief Health Officer, in his advice, noted the detrimental effects of prolonged loss of face-to-face -face schooling experienced by school children in other Australian jurisdictions. So there will be a modified quarantine regime for children. This will mean that students who are not displaying any symptoms of COVID-19, that is, they are asymptomatic, but they've been identified as a close contact, will be able to continue attending school and benefiting from face-to-face -face learning, provided they have tested negative to COVID-19. 
This will apply to all students who have been identified as a close contact, except those who have a household member who has tested positive to COVID-19. These asymptomatic students will be able to attend after school care. They'll also be able to attend school related training or events held immediately before and after school on school grounds. Outside of these school related activities, these students should quarantine. Face to face learning is key, not only for children and young people's learning and development, it's important for their overall well being and their physical and mental health. These revised protocols will mean that students who are showing no sign of illness and have tested negative are able to continue going to school. These asymptomatic students who are close contacts are required to take a further test either on day six if it's a PCR or day seven if it's a rat. As with the ordinary practices in schools, including for example parents explaining absences, parents should advise the school if their child is positive. A student who has COVID-19 symptoms will still be required to stay home and be tested as per the current arrangements. This has been a difficult time for school staff and the period ahead as we go towards the peak is going to be tougher. Principals are under pressure to manage cases of COVID-19 in their schools. Communications need to go out every time there is a positive case in a school. And there are many schools with multiple positive cases across different days. We ask that parents, carers and school communities continue to be understanding of this. Principals also need to focus on what they need to do to deliver face-to-face -face learning to their students in the classroom. As COVID spreads in our community, our schools are facing challenges on a scale they have never faced before. And I ask everyone to respect them as they prioritise learning and wellbeing of their school community at this time. It might mean that some activities or events are postponed. It might mean you don't get a timely response to your email about something that is not COVID related. The public health and social measures that apply now in the high case settings, that is the rules around the numbers who can attend school events, on-site visitors, all of those remain the same. School leaders will continue to apply these measures. But please be understanding if, for example, the excursion that your child was looking forward to does not proceed because schools need to focus their resources on being able to meet the core function of face to face in class learning. The next few weeks are going to be very difficult. I want to thank principals, teachers and all school staff for the way that you've conducted yourselves under the pressure so far. I know that you've been doing this while caring and worrying about your own families, your own school aged children, your own elderly parents or grandparents. I continue to be heartened by the efforts and support and frankly the common sense of the parent community and in particular PNCs who've adapted to the changes and helped school leaders to manage the information sharing. There have been some school communities who've had to manage all of this with protests at their schools. And there have been some parents who've chosen to take out their anger about their own views on vaccinations and other measures out on the people working in schools. This is the very, very small minority, but it has added to the burden carried by school staff. Every day in schools across Western Australia, Educators and school staff deliver world-class education. They infuse the young people in their care with a love of lifelong learning and they set them up to be happy, healthy and productive members of the community. For some students, schools are a refuge and a safe place away from the dangers that can exist in their own homes and their streets. I know that our schools will continue to deliver that education 
and continue to be a refuge for those students who need it over the next few weeks as well. But it will be harder than ever before and I want to thank them in advance for that. I'll now hand back to the Minister for Health for questions and then I'll take questions uh, on schools after that. Is this, is this press conference a distraction away from Dan and the evidence in the federal court today between uh, the Premier and his relationship with billionaire Kerry Stoke? Well, I'm not going to comment on uh, what is currently uh, literally happening at the moment uh, in court, uh, but this is an important announcement in how we're managing COVID going forward. Um, this is part of our planned and methodical approach to managing the high caseload and the very high caseload setting. Um, it's an announcement that will be welcomed by business um, and the community to help us move forward. But does that evidence that uh, has come out in the court today show that the Premier got too close to the media magnate Kerry Stoke? I'm not going to comment on live court, court proceedings. Are you concerned as a cabinet minister that a premier is texting a billionaire from the seats of parliament to give him a heads up on legislation? The premier conducts himself with the highest integrity and he has shown that um, since he became premier in 2017. I have no questions about the standard of the premier's integrity um, and I'm not going to comment so on live court proceedings. Same? Would you do the same? Would you also text a billionaire to tell him about legislation that has been kept secret ahead of it going into the parliament? I don't have those phone numbers uh, and uh, I'm not really interested in continuing to comment on live you court that proceedings. The, 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 the Kerry Stokes and Mark McGowan do have each other's phone numbers and obviously regularly text one another about affairs of state. Uh, members of parliament, members of cabinet have to have relationships across the community across the community and that is appropriate. Uh, we pride ourselves on uh, meeting with everyone, talking to people, consulting, working with the community, working with the business sector, working with unions uh, and that's what we will continue to do. What do you think about someone being called fat? I'm not going to comment on uh, live court proceedings. Are there any discussions on a national level in regards to uh, you know, five-year-old vaccination? Some of our viewers uh, who have their child in Fiji are concerned saying that they want to get their kids back but, but the legislation or the, or the current advice is not ready for them. Uh, that advice around paediatric vaccinations is provided nationally. Uh, we're following the national advice. Uh, there isn't at this stage um, that I'm aware of any vaccination, even globally, that is approved for under five years. Uh, that would need to be approved uh, and at the moment it's five to 11 um, with the eight week period in between the two. How many close contacts are currently known to be subject to isolation orders and how many people have been registered as critical workers? Look, there's been a number of registrations. Um, as we know, the Chief Health Officer has been applying the critical worker uh, requirements or, or rules uh, as, and, as and when required, so for health settings and also for schools and in some critical areas uh, like freight and logistics that were required. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but we can provide that. Um, it's really uh, for businesses to register them. There is some rigour around that process, so we do go through that list to make sure that they're genuinely critical. Um, and there will be some uh, oversight from the Department of Health, but it does require businesses to do the right thing. Um, I would say um, this is a, it's, it's a measure of last resort for those businesses because essentially it potentially could increase spread within those workforces. So we really want people to think carefully about their circumstances. It's really in the instance of critical delivery of services and catastrophic losses. And with 15,000 active cases, how many close contacts um, I don't have that number in front of me, uh, but it would be several thousand. Because I've been asking uh, for it for days now. Is, are we able to get that number? I'll certainly talk to the public health team. Um, the contact tracing is occurring in targeted high risk areas. So that's where we're focusing our contact tracing efforts. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, close contacts will be uh, uh, self-appointed, if you like, or self-nominated because they know that they are. That not everyone will necessarily get a text message from the department at this point. Now that we're in very... We can do, yep. We can, we can find out and let, give you that information. With 3,500 daily cases, the Queen of Five Trier to move to very high Look, there wasn't a, one single predefined trigger. Um, we didn't have a number in in um, in mind. There's a number of uh, considerations, um, and particularly around um, 
critical industries. Uh, so we have had a number of requests from industry, um, and we want to be able, we want industry to be able to put the rules in place uh, before it gets uh, too late. We saw from the experience over east that uh, there was a bit of a scramble to do it during the very high caseload setting. So this is to give notice to allow those industries to um, look at their operations. Will it be applicable for them, and to allow them to put that in place? So have you always had a plan to do this announcement today, or or was this a distraction from what's happening over east? Uh, this is an important progress in our, how we're managing COVID. So we have always planned to move to very high caseload settings when we get to very high cases. So we're at three and a half thousand and we're seeing every couple of days those cases are doubling. Around the 14th of March we expect to be at around the peak, so at around 10,000 cases a day. That's only a few days away. So we need to make sure that business and industry and critical services, the non-government sector, have the time that they need to put this in place. Was there advice from the Chief Health Officer today saying we need to do this now? Uh, we received advice that it should be today or um, soon after, I think, and the advice will be published on the website. When did you get that advice? Uh, I think we received it uh, a couple of days ago, I'll find out. Uh, but uh, discussions occurred, this is what we need to do. We did, when we made the announcement late in January, we did um, outline the very high caseload parameters. So we did outline that we would always move to this. But not a threshold. Not, at, not one specific threshold. Uh, and we were still completing the modelling, so we would understand where we would be and when. Uh, based on the current uh, modelling, we're tracking, our numbers are tracking almost exactly as the modelling predicted, and uh, the Chief Health Officer has now formally provided There's that advice. There's confusion around testing. Can you explain why on the single rat fact sheet by the Health Department, it says on one line, and I can provide you a copy, you do, if you have a positive rat, you do not need to see the follow-up PCR test. And then three lines later on the same page, it says if you return a positive rat, you must immediately seek the follow-up PCR test. You can understand why people are confused, can't you? Yes, I can, uh, and obviously that's not particularly helpful. Um, rat tests are now formal diagnostic tools. You don't have to seek a PCR test. You can, um, and in some circumstances you may want to, particularly if it's a, a faint positive. People who do are being turned away from testing clinics. That shouldn't be happening, uh, and I was disappointed to hear in the media that that had occurred, and that asymptomatic people arriving at clinics had also been turned away. It's still happening. Well, I've clarified with uh, Pathwest that uh, that will not be occurring, and that people who turn up um, are tested. Uh, that is for the state clinics. There are privately run clinics that the state does not have uh, necessarily uh, management of. Now we request that they still test those people. Um, for privately run clinics, you won't be hand they won't be handing out rats. Um, they see that as a potential income loss, so they have declined to hand out the state supply of rats, but you will be able to get rats at state run clinics. If Dr. Robertson's advice was given a few days ago and there was no specific threshold, when was the decision made in government to make this announcement? Well, the decision was made when we had the final advice, um, and I think that was received late last night, uh, and that's why we've made the announcement. But this is part of our planned approach to managing COVID. Uh, we're not going to put it off because of other, other events. Uh, we need to be able to ensure that the community and important community services and schools have the settings in place that they need to be able to manage these caseloads going forward. Are you encouraged by the relatively low number of hospitalisations in WA? Could that be um, earlier changes to move it through restrictions and increase the budget? Well, we're watching day by day. Uh, and the settings are examined day by day um, in line with the hospitalisations. Um, I am encouraged by the lower number of people, at, well there's no one in ICU, that's the most encouraging figure for me. Uh, um, so that is very good and I think it is testament to providing time for the community to have their third third booster dose because uh, we know that that is your best protection against Omicron. So certainly the ICU rates are very encouraging. We actually don't expect hospitalisations to peak for a week past the case peak. So we're still very early on in the curve for hospitalisations. So if we expect the cases to peak at around the 14th of March, it'll be closer to the 21st of March that we actually start to see those hospitalisations peak. how many peak. people are coming in for COVID as opposed to with COVID? Have you given any sort of direction on that and what kind of age groups is the predominant? 
It's a, it's a mix of people who are in, um, whether you've got COVID uh, and it's just COVID or COVID with a range of other health conditions still makes it uh, a very you know, concerning situation for people and they still need the same kind of care as whether it's for or with. Now the number's higher, is the vaccination breakdown possible of hospital cases? Yes, it is. We'll be doing that for percent, we'll be able to provide percentage cases. Um, yes, we will be doing that. Do you have that now? I don't. Uh, we've heard countless times that the hospitals here are ready. Why is ambulance ramping no different, if not worse, than the same time it was last year? Well, I would have to uh, check that. I think um, I'd probably respectfully disagree. I think that it is, um, it's tracking downwards. It's picked up a little bit um, in February, but it has tracked down consistently since August last year. It's tracked down from that period, but looking at March of last year and March of this year, it's <laughs> almost identical. Um, there's probably a number of factors, uh, and uh, what we're also seeing is a whole range of new infection and uh, control procedures in hospitals with COVID. Essentially, COVID slows everything down. It slows it down in the ambulances, it slows it down in the hospitals. I, saw it, I heard it described well by one clinician as like pouring sand into a finely tuned machine because everything slows down. PPE has to be donned and doffed and changed. We're screening people um, at the EDs. We're triaging them. People are having rats. Uh, so there's a whole range of processes that are now in place that is slowing that down. This will probably get worse. We will probably see ramping figures um, you know, increase over the coming months while people are coming in with COVID and those extra precautions are being taken to protect the staff. You mentioned uh, settings are being monitored uh, day by day. Has there been any reconsideration of the level two restrictions around community support, restrict restricting it for parents and guardians? Uh, there's no consideration at this point, uh, and we're, but we're always um, open to looking at what can be done. Uh, certainly with the hospital visiting um, hours, uh, that the Chief Health Officer made a recommendation that was um, a bit broader for people's circumstances, acknowledging that not everyone has the same circumstances. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor those. Uh, we do want we do want life to continue um, as much as possible, as safely as possible. Given those level two restrictions on community support, why did you and Anthony Albanese attend a photo op two days after those restrictions started at the Miranda Football Club? Why was that okay? So that event was not a community sport event. It was an announcement benefiting a local community sporting group. Um, it was all um, within accordance of the Chief Health Officer's rules. Um, it was under 50 people and it met all of those requirements. We want events, we want the community to continue um, going about their business in the safest possible way. We want schools to continue going about their business in a COVID safe way. We want businesses to continue, we want sport to continue and we want announcements to continue where possible that are going to benefit those communities. Is it a good look though? I mean it was outside but you were maskless, shoulder to shoulder while you're telling people they can't go see their niece or nephew play football that you're there for a photo op. Is it an appropriate look? look? Those restrictions are in place for a very short time and for as short as we can possibly make it. Uh, that that event that. met all of the requirements of the Chief Health Officer and it was a COVID safe event. Uh, I think it's a good thing to be making announcements that support local community groups. And um, as we've seen uh, federal members traveling over, um, over to Western Australia, now that the border's down, so the grandparents then perhaps just need to attend the local football oval and make an announcement with a cheque for a dollar to get around the rules? Look, I think uh, it's a bit uh, petty of uh, David Honey in particular. Um, I think this is a good announcement for a local community. It met all of the Chief Health Officer's requirements. Um, we want the community to continue going about their business um, as much as possible. We need heard. data, sorry, they need data releases um, around vaccination status of people at hospital. But when will that actually start? How frequent will it be? And, and what other kind of data are you actually going to provide? So New South Wales provides quite a lot of information, but um, in terms of WA Health, we've been getting less information now. We don't get any. We don't know how many check-ins. Um, people are still following that system, although where that sort of has actually been going down. My understanding is we have been providing check-in information. Uh, and certainly the vaccination status um, requires access to Commonwealth data. Um, that's, that can be challenging. Um, we're working through those issues with the Commonwealth to ensure that we can match the state's records with the patient's records um, and making sure that we're providing accurate information. What about a breakdown of cases by local government area, which is something that a lot of other states do? Well, we used to do. 
We're doing it by region, not by local government area, and that's how we'll continue to report. I'm um, not sure that it's necessary um, in Western Australia and uh, we are doing it certainly in the metropolitan area and by regional, regional areas. Um, doing it by local government area, there are enormous numbers of certainly country local governments and it could start to identify individual cases. Um, no one in ICU currently, but it must be said there was another death recorded this week. Um, it was mentioned that the woman in her 40s has underlying health conditions. Mm. Are you able to, without breaching confidentiality, say anything more about that, whether COVID did contribute to her death? Um, you know, is there any more available information? The death is being listed as a COVID death. I can't give you any details about her underlying health conditions because that, that would be a breach of patient confidentiality, but I can confirm that it was a COVID death. Have you spoken to her family or her descendants? I have not. I've heard that very patients quick, in emergency very departments are being left waiting for extended periods of time because of bedlock in hospitals like Fiona Stanley. Is this a problem and what is the availability of beds in those COVID hospitals? Well, every hospital, every tertiary hospital is taking COVID patients uh, and uh, people cer certainly uh, processes have slowed down in terms of moving patients in. Um, we also in the next couple of weeks we'll be lifting the elective surgery for um, non-urgent and that will that will free up a number of those beds um, and get people moving through the wards. So is it an issue with beds or PPE or both? Well it's an issue, there's a, let me start that again. The hospital processes slow down when we have COVID. Plus we're also managing uh, um, elective surgery which uses up beds and staff. When that elective surgery for non-urgent stops, that will free up those beds and those staff. And as we see the in increase in COVID patients, we which we expect to peak at about 450 per day at the peak, that will provide more beds for those patients. So you're still expecting that peak <coughs> considering where we're at at the moment. The modelling seems wildly inaccurate at the moment in terms of hospitalisations. The modelling is actually very accurate in terms of hospitalisations. And uh, we are certainly expecting that peak a week after the peak of cases. So uh, we have enough beds in the system and we also have the capacity to use private beds too. So once we start reaching that peak, uh, the elective surgery for privates will also be scaled down and then we'll have access to those beds and those staff. So I do want to assure people there are plenty of beds in the system to cope with the peak and with those hospitalisations. So you do still expect the peak to be 450 Yes. Yes, yeah, we do. Yep. I and mean, we, the chief health officer, sorry, the chief health officer did say that the uh, modelling was conservative. Um, I hope that we don't get there uh, for the sake of all of those people. Uh, but I certainly, we, we're certainly preparing for it. Just on teachers, I don't know who's best to answer, but uh, we were told that they will be deemed as critical workers if there's no relief uh, teachers or other staff who can fill their position. Who makes that judgment and? Sort of I'll, I'll hand over to the Education Minister if you've finished with me. No, I've I've got got one. One. Okay, I'll go here and then come over. Um, just to review then, 14th of March, the peak is the case number, still sitting around 10,000 per day at that point? Yes, it is. A uh, non COVID question Has there been any known cases of Japanese encephalitis in WA? Not in Western Australia. Uh, that I've been informed of, um, but it is starting to become a national public health issue. Um, I'm about to receive a briefing from the department, uh, but I have, we have not had any cases in Western Australia. Um, some of the university lecturers, um, you know, not, you know, of course the government currently, you know, have decided to encourage people to work from home, but some, uh, some uni uh, lecturers uh, have been, rather than having orders to work from the university rather than given the ability to work from home, are you disappointed? Look, those um, organisations have to make an operational decision uh, based on their circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so very Minister, good. that um, call as to whether or not relief teachers can be found or yep. other staff can fill the position, who's that up to and what sort of oversight is there? Uh, so every single principal makes a decision about their own staffing. Um, many of them will have a pool of relief staff that they regularly use. Um, but you will recall that I had announced earlier we have 
um, a pool of several thousand, I think it's 5,000 from memory, casual staff available as well. But each of those staffing decisions is made at a school level by the relevant principal. It's like consent only? Absolutely. What about students? What if families don't feel comfortable sending their kids back? Um, look, we're heading into a really difficult time um, and I can understand a parent making a decision, you know what, for our family, for the next couple of weeks, we're just going to, once a child's been identified as a close contact, um, we're not going to send our child to school. I understand that um, and uh, and if that happens, you know, it's we're not going to kind of uh, send people out looking for kids to force them back to school. Is the, are the very high case settings for close contact under age who do not wear masks in classroom and most of them aren't vaccinated? No. But are there any concerns about that? I mean, it really is kindy, preschool, year one and two that it's going to spread quickest, isn't it? Um, because they're not vaccinated, mm -hmm. correct. Um, although I have to say our experience so far, and this is just so far, is that the youngest of children are not, it's not those classes in the schools that are popping up. So now, more than 2, that might be... You're right. Sorry. That might change um, as the peak happens. I don't know. Um, it's just an observation that was made to me by the Director General. That it, it looks that way. Ne nevertheless, nevertheless, um, this is a difficult time, um, and uh, we trust parents to make the decisions that are right for them. Uh, nobody is going to go into this, um, you know, sending out the truancy officers to get four-year-olds. Will parents be told? Um, I don't know if that is part of the protocol, um, but I can, I'll confirm that for you and let you know. Um, all parents will be advised of this regime that's in place. Um, and in fact, the, um, you know, the measures that would be put in place would be no different for anyone else. Um, for the teacher themselves, they have to provide a rat every day. Um, and they'll be provided with those. Um, if there's any change, I'll confirm that at the end of this, but I don't think there is. Is it, is it, appropriate, is it appropriate for the Premier and the Attorney General to be text messaging one another about uh, someone as a big fat liar? Um, look, I know that there is, um, the case is literally uh, on foot as we speak. What do you think of and the term also, big fat liar? If you let me finish. Well, what do you think of the term big fat liar? It's got nothing to do with court papers. What do you think of the term big fat liar to describe someone? Um, Gary, if you would let me say what I want to say. Um, there's a court case ongoing. There's been news reports today that la language has been used uh, in text messages. I'm not going to comment on a case that is on foot now. Are you disappointed at the Premier using the term? Because he doesn't deny that in the court case that he used the term and the Attorney General used the term big fat liar to describe Clive Palmer. Um, as I just said, the case is on foot now and I note it's a defamation case. I'm not going to comment on a matter that is literally before the courts right now. Can I go back to James's question? If parents might not be aware of um, close contacts who are either teachers or students in their kids' class, where does that leave families, particularly who are high risk for whatever reason, special needs kids or you know, kids or parents with high risk conditions, do they have adequate information to make decisions about their health or whether they need to isolate themselves from that environment? There are already additional measures in place for families with children who have um, either high um, disability needs or who are immunocompromised. There are a range of supports that are already in place, have been in place um, for those families since the start of school. Um, parents will be notified in the normal arrangements that we have place in place now uh, where there is a close contact in that class. The question was, once a close contact teacher who is asymptomatic and who agrees to continue um, going to work, um, whether the parents are notified about that, I will confirm that at the end of the presser today. The close contact students will also be able to go back to school if the close contact's not in their household and so Correct. parents won't know the status of the, the student their kid's sitting next to? Parents will get all of this information sent to them. Um, all parents will get that information sent to them and they will understand uh, the system that's in place. 
Um, schools are spending an awful lot of time explaining this um, to parents who want clarification or are seeking further advice, and all of that advice will be provided to parents. Uh, what do you say to parents and families that have already spent multiple periods of isolation um, over, you know, since school has started? Some people have had to isolate twice or three times since the year started. Do you have anything to say to them? Um, this has been a difficult time, there's no question about that. We have taken the Chief Health Officer's um, advice on how do we um, minimise the disruption to schooling and to families and to businesses. And we've adjusted as we've needed to adjust and this is a further adjustment to allow that to happen. So for those um, families that are in quarantine today, um, part way through that quarantine today, from tomorrow if they provide um, a negative test, they can return to work. But there's no, there's no getting around the fact this has been disruptive um, and difficult for all West Australians. No, no getting a, a, around that, no backing away from that. What we're trying to do is to make sure that we continue the most important thing for school aged children, which is face to face learning. We've heard reports of um, school carnivals and school restaurants being cancelled as a result of COVID style shortages. Can you confirm that that's happening or should parents expect that? Uh, I'm not sure if that's happened to date, but the point I made in my opening comments was that. Um, while the arrangements remain in place about what you can uh, do in terms of activities and excursions and all of the like, I'm asking parents and communities to be um, patient that if the main focus of the school as we head into the peak and then through the peak is making sure that they have enough staff to continue the core business, which is the face-to-face -face learning, if that means a principal needs to make a decision that a certain event isn't going to proceed, I'm asking people to be patient with that. The core focus is for them to be able to staff the classrooms so that students can do face-to-face -face learning. Do you think it would have been better or easier for parents and schools to just move to these settings initially, just so there was kind of one set of rules that they had to get used to rather than it changing? Um, I doubt that um, parents would have appreciated uh, that from day one. Um, there's no question, as I said, it's been disruptive and it's been difficult. What we've tried to do is get the balance right so that education could continue for as long as possible to include all of the things that education includes, which is excursions, which is school balls, which is all of those things, um, for as long as we could. But the responsible way to do that was to act on the health advice and adjust the settings and the requirements as we needed to. Can I just get your response to Dr Andrew Miller says that this latest adjustment tomorrow will effectively enable infection among unvaccinated kids, knowing that a minority, but still a few, will get very sick as a result? Um, there will be more cases and the, the public health advice is always about that balance between three things. Um, the clinical status, the epidemiology, and the impact that the virus has, balanced up against the social impact of closing schools, balanced up against the impact on the economy if parents have to stay home to look after their children. So it is the case that there will be an increase in cases, but this is about trying to get that balance right for a period of time that based on what we've seen elsewhere, um, cases numbers will peak and then will start to go down. It's about trying to get that balance right. And I understand the point that he's making, um, but it is about balancing those three things. Those text messages between Kerry Stokes and the Premier, how comfortable are you with the relationship between um, the Premier and Kerry? Um, I don't know anything about text messages that you're referring to. The first I heard was when I was sitting down there and questions were being put to Amber. I'll make the comment that I've made um, previously. I'm not going to comment on matters that I'm told now have arisen during the course um, of a matter that is literally on foot in court now. Minister, did, are you suggesting that you had no idea what was playing out in federal court earlier on today? I heard the, uh, I read online the reference to the exchanges of texts um, about um, uh, between Mr McGowan and Attorney General about Mr Palmer. The first I heard uh, about the reference to texts with um, uh, uh, Mr Stokes was when I heard you say it. And what was your reaction when you saw that exchange between Mr Quigley and Mr McGowan? I've already answered that, Gary. I've said I'm not going to make a comment on a matter that is literally before the courts as we speak. So, just very quickly, some parents are still uh, urging, uh, urging the government to 
give them remote education options. Uh, I understand that the government wants, wants to emphasise on face-to-face learning, but should they be given that choice? Should parents be given that choice? All of the evidence from all around Australia and indeed overseas is that face-to-face learning is the most important thing for children, not just because of what they learn, but because of the socialisation, because um, of all of the other elements that go with a child's um, mental and physical development at a school. So for those reasons, um, we want to get it absolutely right and make sure we maximise the amount of time that students can spend at school and minimise the disruption. These announcements today are based on advice from the Chief Health Officer. Why isn't Dr Robertson here to take questions? Uh, I'm not sure that I could even... That's not been raised with me and um, I don't work that closely with Mr Robinson. Perhaps you can direct that to the so Minister of Health. Clarify, when did you decide to hold this press conference? Um, we were talking about holding this press conference uh, over the weekend. Uh, the Chief Health Officer's uh, advice, I have a copy with it, of it with me now, was provided yesterday. Thanks, I'll hand back to Minister for Health if you want to blow that up. I ask if this is something that's been often raised by the Australian Medical Association and others when there's announcements like this. They often point out that chief health officers are regularly absent and not available to take questions on announcements based on his advice. Why isn't he here today? Uh, well, I can confirm that the advice was provided on the 8th, uh, so yesterday. Um, and it's appropriate for us to announce that advice today. Um, and I would probably respectfully disagree with that. I think um, Dr Robinson is here regularly, as is the Commissioner. Um, we can make him available at the next uh, press conference. He's managing a major pandemic at the moment. The public health team are very busy. Um, but I'm more than happy for him to attend the ne next press conference. Thanks very much. Thank you.